hello and welcome back to another Mid Ulster Amateur uh, Radio Club Tuesday night lecture. We're so glad you could join us here this evening. Uh, we have our um, great club member and world, I'm going to say world pixie kit leading enthusiast with us this evening to talk to us on all things pixie land and adventures and qrp and everything else so uh you're in for a real treat this evening the other thing is as well if you're joining us via youtube well done uh, i hope you enjoy the video and why not consider joining us some tuesday evening for a live recording here on zoom and uh, you can get the details from our club uh, website and Twitter feed as well. So, Liz, good evening. Good evening, Dave, and uh, everybody. Uh, uh, and um, uh, how exciting is it that we're all going to be talking about pixies this evening? <laughs> Liz, you know me. I've told you before, and I'll tell you again. I could listen to your stories until the cows come home, as they say over here. But why don't you start off, uh, and I'll hand over to you here in a wee second. Why don't you start off, tell us a little bit about yourself, your call sign even, uh, what you do and everything else. And then you can, we're, we're at your mercy there for your, your lovely story. So Les, over to you. Thanks, thanks Dave. Um, well, um, where, where, where do I start? Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a retired uh, biogas engineer. So I've spent my whole life um, converting um, uh, cattle manure into electricity, hot water and fertilizer. I've been very, very uh, concerned up to doctoral level um, in the environment. So um, I've done an awful lot um, in biology. So where, where does the uh, amateur radio come in? Well, my father uh, was one of the um, most amazing electronic engineers. He built our first television sets. Uh, he enabled um, the circuitry to, um, uh, uh, to, to work uh, that connected uh, TV, color TV cameras. Uh, to Goonhilly and the satellite systems, which are therefore enabled color TV. Um, and he was an amateur radio, G4OFS. And so I've got two people I'm dedicating this uh, talk to. One is my father, um, uh, 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 G4 uh, off frequency Sid, as he used to be known. And, um, and, and also uh, the QRP guru of the uh, century, really. Uh, George Dobbs, Re the Reverend George uh, Dobbs, uh, G3RJV. So I grew up at the age of, um, uh, 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 in, uh, in, in the age of valves, and um, uh, built my first transistor radio, which didn't connect to the, um, uh, the mains with a wire, uh, when I was about nine years old. And I've been interested in... Um, in, in radio ever since. Does that do enough? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I thought you were talking about me there when you said, uh, started talking about biogas engineering and everything else, but that's another story, Les. That's um, another story. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so, where are we off okay. to tonight, Les? Completely over to you now. Right, well, um, I've called this little talk Adventures with QRP Radio, uh, but it also relates to my interest in the environment. And um, uh, most people know uh, um, uh, how far we got with the pixie radios and so on, um, but things moved on for a couple of years. I want to show you what, what uh, um, the developments that I've gone through um, look like. And, um, and then uh, uh, um, we'll go on a little adventure to the Outer Hebrides last January to do some QRP radio and uh, to pick up an environmental scientist who was lecturing on climate change and then deliver him home to Inverness 
in the snow, in an electric car with the smallest battery, uh, a 24 kilowatt hour, five year old Nissan Leaf. So here we go. I'm going to try and uh, I, I think I can have to share the screen here now. So uh, I'll do that now. Okay, so this is um, Adventures with QRP Radio. And um, uh, we've had a little bit of a, a, a glitch in startup, but that's Richard with a field um, setup comprising um, uh, uh, simply a, um, uh, a cutting board and a toothbrush and a very cheap uh, pixie radio. Um, and he was actually having a, a fantastic QSO there uh, at the time. Now, I'm, can you still see this screen? Has that changed now? We've what now went to uh, all frequency Sid, and the Reverend hey, Dobbs. Excellent. Right, we're flying now. <laughs> Modern technology. Um, so I'm dedicating this to these two gentlemen, uh, Sid Gornall, my father, uh, G4OFS, and the Reverend uh, George Dobbs, G3RJV. And um, uh, they've both been inspirational for me in, uh, in, in uh, amateur radio, and in particular QRP radio. My father had the highest regard for the, the beauty and simplicity of the circuits that George Dobbs provided over a 50-year period. So this is where we start, I guess. If you waggle the electrons leaking from the terminals of a PP3 9 volt battery at 7 million times in one second, then from the viewpoint of the electrons, the world as we know it largely disappears. Pushed into a resonant antenna, the electric and magnetic field vibration passes through most solid things unnoticed. And that's why a transistor radio works inside a brick house and why the TV with a set-top antenna works. Metals at these frequencies seem to glow and salty water, including humans who are largely made of this, uh, usually reflect the, radio, the electromagnetic waves. But the most amazing phenomenon occurs in the upper atmosphere. Here, the sun shines on thin gases and electrons dance, sometimes causing aurora, but usually the effects are invisible to human senses. A few hundred kilometers above us, from the viewpoint of the minuscule electric field propagating at the speed of light from our antenna, the radio wave we have created sees above it a highly polished silver mirror encircling the earth. This radio wave plunges into the upper atmospheric mirror and is gradually refracted back down to earth thousands of miles away, where it may be detected as a seven million times a second whistle. Turn the transmitted signal on and off by effectively disconnecting and reconnecting the battery and add Morse code that translates these on-off signals into language and you can talk to the whole world from this little PP3 9 volt battery. Welcome to the QRP radio world. I'm not sure whether this will work or not. We'll try and get this little video to uh, work. But this is John McCulloch, who you well know. Uh, GI4BQI, my Morse Elma, with a Perspex Pixie, a 9-volt battery, and a Molar Morse key. We had a QSO with Scotland at about a quarter of a watt that day at Locker and Rally. And in the next 40 minutes, I'll illustrate where my QRP building has got me so far and will take you with me on a real journey to the Outer Hebrides in the middle of January last year in the hope that it will inspire, inspire you to have as much fun as I'm having with QRP radio. 
So here's the most basic, simple radio transmitter receiver. This is taken on November the 3rd, 2017. The Redmint Tin is a new build, a Hypermite audio filter from Four State QRP with my little bypass switch modification. So I put out a CQ. I had, I had just a few minutes before a business conference call, so what to do? Well, you plug the battery into the Pixie with its original crystal at 7.023 megahertz, which is not the, um, the normal uh, European QRP frequency for calling, which is 7.030. I've got a little VXO modification. Well, basically, it's that knob on the side of the green tin uh, that um, uh, changes a little variable capacitor on one leg of the crystal. Connect the two mint tins together so that the audio signal can be um, filtered. So the high and the low uh, frequency, audio frequency, um, uh, signals are, are lost and we get a pure uh, Morse uh, signal from one um, uh, from, from uh, one transmit transmission bingo after two calls GDO IFU comes back from the Isle of Man not bad considering the antenna is almost on the ground in a and slacked off uh, because of the storms that were happening at the time. I mean, these are just uh, uh, so memorable. QRP connections are simply that, they're memorable. Well, after that, I decided a little bit more power and a little bit more frequency agility was required. Two watts, designed by George Dobbs, G3RJV, with its superb Z-match tuner, this is the sudden transmitter, the sudden receiver, and the sudden Z-match tuner. Well, sudden because that's the name of the village that George was living in when he invented uh, uh, the circuitry. The GQRP club designs the kits and sells them for about 40 pounds a module, and they're very, very easy to build. The tuner I have used on almost every expedition, the ultra bright, bright LED lights up in proportion to the reflected power wasted by poor SWR. So null this and the light goes out, the signal gets out. Well, the next rig was Hans Summer's QCX 20, 20 meter rig. Paired with a sudden tuner during uh, uh, um, uh, uh, during and this is during construction. You can see it's without a box. Uh, that, I, I realize this made a great pairing. The included 700 hertz plus or minus 100 hertz sharp audio filter was exactly it was identical um, to the four state QRP hypermite, but this time it's not in a separate mint tin, it's built in to the kit absolutely wonderful and this kit comes with built-in um, electronic um, uh, instrumentation and tools to align uh, the circuitry um, uh, and you you need virtually nothing but a voltmeter uh, to make this work there it is in a box um, absolutely lovely radio it's one of my favorite radios digital control uh with frequency output display more than a couple of watts of class c power to the antenna a shed load of functions on the two buttons and control knobs including uh, um, uh, uh, your call sign which can be memorized and then uh, uh, sent without you having to type it uh, every time when you're doing a long uh, series of uh, uh, um, uh, CQ calls. So 20 meter rig, the problem is the 20 meter band is down at the moment. Um, we need some spots, uh, but they're just around the corner. 
So my first choice for an expedition QRP radio was actually the CQX uh, um, CW 20 meter rig, but without a band being active, without the, the right F layer uh, um, being energized in the upper atmosphere, uh, the 40 meter band was probably required. So um, this was my uh, choice for going up to the Outer Hebrides. And for a single sideband, uh, the rig I chose was uh, an old but excellent ICOM 703 with an internal tuner. And, um, and this uh, had been given to me by uh, my old friend who introduced me to um, 20 meter band operations in the Kalahari Desert in 1968, uh, Alpha 2 Charlie Alpha Susan. And I met up with him recently. Uh, he's now a silent key, unfortunately. And um, uh, he, he passed this over to me and I've used it ever since. So here's the expedition. We call this expedition changing the climate one charge at a time. And um, this is a picture from uh, uh, Harris. Uh, you can see the car involved. Um, so a little bit of background about how this came about. Well, every January, the Baha'i community in Stornoway has an annual lecture celebrating World Religion Day. And in 2019, um, last well, two, two Januaries ago, uh, Arctic and Antarctic explorer Rolf Schmidt uh, was to speak on climate change. Uh, on the third Sunday of January, as I remember it. And so this was the goal. The goal was to meet Rolf in Stornoway, play with QRP radio from Stornoway in the far northwest uh, Isle of Lewis, um, then take him home to Inverness, emission free, return to work in Manchester, and sail back to Macrofelt via the Liverpool Belfast Ferry. Um, there's the little map. The total distance is over a thousand miles. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, this is the star. The star is a car, a Nissan Leaf. Then it was three years old with the smallest 24 kilowatt hour battery, uh, an e-car charger access card from Northern Ireland for free to use Northern Ireland chargers, zero road tax, zero emissions. Now the battery range gives 85 miles, minus 12 miles if a heater and lights are used. If you do the sums there, it's uh, um, just over 70 miles. Uh, but then you have to leave uh, 15 miles in the tank in case your, your, your uh, a uh, charger is working and you have to move to the next charger. So we're talking um, a, a stress-free range of about 60 miles here. But why an electric car? Well, zero emissions. Um, we'll go on to the reasons uh, why perhaps later, but in a re recent lecture to the uh, Anaerobic Digester Network, uh, it was noted that in less than a decade, wind and solar sources will be producing electricity so cheaply, it will not pay the producers to bill, to bill for it. It will be, electricity will be a free good. Now, the only thing I can compare this to is the price of long distance calls uh, uh, on um, uh, copper wires in 1960, which, probably required half a day's wages to pay for, and uh, this Zoom meeting, which could be going right around the world free of charge, essentially. So this is Rolf on the right-hand side, and he spent years measuring sea temperatures down the mid-Atlantic ridge from the Arctic to the An Antarctic. I must remember to, sell, to spell uh, uh, Arctic correctly next time because otherwise somebody who drives one is going to remind me. Um, he now runs a whale watching business from a solar powered paddle boat uh, uh, out of Inverness. 
And he described how he spent, um, I think, one and a half decades uh, in charge of the censors um, uh, uh, running, uh, uh, running backwards and forwards from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again, um, measuring salinity of water, carbon dioxide and temperature of water. This man uh, really knows uh, 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 what's going on. So that's the man we're going to pick up. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, there might not be any charges on the route. We could run out of battery. It's January. Uh, on a Scottish Highland, we could die of exposure or simply get stranded. Um, so I contacted the Scottish Baha'i community for assistance and made a plan. And this was part one of the plan. Glasgow and Oban for the ferry to Barra. Now, this is one of the most beautiful parts of the, of, of the world if you've never traveled it. Um, and the plan was uh, to use, and we did go in this direction, Larne, Gervan, Kilmarnock, Glasgow, Arakar, Inverera, and Oban. So off we go, we get on the ferry and uh, arrive in Gervan, first fail. This is the charger, and we get onto the, um, the, 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 the mobile phone, which just about works, and uh, we're told uh, your Northern Ireland card does no work in Scotland, and we nearly died. That was the end of the, almost the end of the whole journey. But don't worry, said the friendly gentleman at the end. Uh, we'll get the charge going remotely, and then you can log on to our website and obtain your card online. Brilliant. Uh, so here's the logic. You use your iPhone to go online, but there's only one vode. Uh, it, that's a signal strength of, um, uh, I am barely making it. It's like a signal strength of three uh, in Gervan. And, it's voice enabled, but not digitally enabled the network. Um, and the idea that we will send, uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, they may, when you talk to them, they say, we'll send the, uh, the, the card to the address on your credit card for security, which is in Northern Ireland, and we're in Scotland. The new e-card e uh, uh, you will need for all the charges in Scotland. Well, um, we almost thought of turning back, but uh, that's really not in my nature. <laughs> so it was on to Kilmarnock uh, with a remotely connected charge up from uh, um, the, the kind people on the end of the uh, system. And this brand new charger in a petrol station was indicated on the ZAP map, which tells you where all these things are. 22 kilowatt charge rate, which is very good. There's four miles per uh, kilowatt hour so every hour that puts in 88 miles into your uh, uh, into your car and access was by a normal bank visa card and then when we came to paying it it said as a trial this is free win so off we then powered to Kilmarnock now this is my old friend Derek from Belfast uh, and uh, his photograph of me indicates that my char car charge was now less of a priority than finding the loo. First rule, human biology gives out before the car battery. Uh, there's a top tip there for any um, a potential garage owner to uh, uh, put an electric charger. Um, if you've got a loo and a charger and a cup of coffee machine, you're going to make a fortune. Um, so it was lunch with Big D and off to Glasgow. And uh, there, this charger is inside an overnight garage for the Charing Cross Railway Station. It was provided by yet another organization that needed to be signed up to. But here, underground, you can't get a signal to sign up. <laughs> so I reparked the car in a free space, booked into the Premier Inn, went up four flights, signed in from there, back down to the underground park, part of the car park, and then connected. Unfortunately, it was a very slow charger. It was an overnight charger, and this gives you a big fill, 100% charge, and it's just what we needed to, to, to hill climb over the trussocks 
to Oban. And here's another note. The uh, maps show many, many charges in the city of Glasgow, but each one of them has an all-electric taxi attached and they will not let you on. They only remove themselves from their stands for another taxi. And that's, that to me is a big fail for the system. So in Glasgow, after an introduction to René Macintosh's wonderful architecture shown on the left here, um, I met up with ex-Hebridean Barra Islander and an old friend from university, Nick Sanders, who traveled that morning, um, it was a freezing cold morning, from the other side of Edinburgh. Doesn't he look cold in front of the coffee shop? <laughs> um, Glasgow to Oban, then for the ferry to Barra and over the Trussocks. Now, um, you can see Loch Lomond there on the map. Uh, that's Highland, that's a very high loch. And um, one never knows how many miles you're going to get out of the, uh, the 24 kilowatt hour battery uh, when you're going um, up very steep hills. Well, we just about made it, and it was really nice to see the battery charging up as we cruised down the other side of the hills. Um, and so we ended up with just about 10 miles left in the tank um, in our car, an absolutely perfect spot. Uh, we made a telephone call, and that enabled the fast charger without a card. And then we walked into this beautiful little town, uh, came back uh, thoroughly recharged ourselves and with the battery charged and it was off to um, uh, towards Oban. Well, the, the halfway point charge was Inverara, Inverara, I'm told it's pronounced, not Inverare. I was pick, it was picked up several times. But this is home of the vital spark, the last working Clyde Puffer, a cold, coal-fired lifeline to the islands and it's next door to a very good charger and we connected remotely and provided enough power uh, to get us to Oban and here we are in Oban walking around for two days while the storm passed and uh, the ferry uh, was was basically grounded uh, until um, until we could uh, uh, get some calm sea. And then it was a perfect sailing past Tobamori, famous on children's TV, to Castle Bay in Barra. And now we're threading our way through the islands. At Barra, um, well, let's just have a look at these islands. They look disconnected. Some of those inter-island connections are causeways, and some are ferries. And um, uh, it's longer, it's a longer distance than you think. Uh, that's, I can't see a scale on there, but um, uh, um, you'll see what happened with the battery. So in Barra, I stayed with Irene and Paul Donnelly on Battersea. Um, south of Barra, is this tiny little island uh, where Paul and Irene uh, uh, probably have the best view ever for breakfast. They can see seals, sometimes uh, 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 dolphins and whales, and um, uh, just around the corner there are orcas. Uh, this is a most remarkable place, and this their house just looks over the lock. And um, and they suggested uh, uh, Nick. Uh, who was who used to live on this island uh, of Barra uh, should visit John Penry. Now this is John Penry. Uh, so Nick Nick said, look, um, Nick, uh, 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 John planted decades ago the very first trees on the island as little one meter whips. Let's go and see it. So here's John now in what he calls, uh, rather jokingly, St. John's Wood. Um, it's a beautiful, verdant 
uh, and productive woodland and he lives off the uh, uh, the the fruit and the, the timber and the wood products from this little uh, woodland that he's that he's sting. Then it was Barra to Eriske. Here the salt spray had corroded the DC charger connector and we actually needed the help of the RNLI lifeboat engineer to help disconnect the car after charging but it was connected remotely after a phone call and charged okay um, so we had a full battery we just couldn't disconnect the car um, so after a few um, hammer blows and <laughs> and so on we uh, uh, we disconnected and you can see in the middle of Barra Bay is the, 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 this, this famous little castle. And um, it was off on the ferry to Eriske. Now Eriske is famous for these wild horses. Uh, they're absolutely adorable. They'll probably give you a bite. They're quite feisty. Um, and we were, we were lucky to see several groups close up. Uh, this one was keeping guard and we nudged forward and it just kind of faced us off until it uh, uh, um, uh, move, moved over to one side. Uh, really adorable wild horses. This is the middle of January and they're completely uh, comfortable uh, in this wild environment. Very hardy. And then from Eriske, uh, the causeway, uh, which looks at the end of the causeway like this. And you can see there's bits of storm brewing and um, it's still very cold. Uh, there was frost on the ground in the morning, but that cleared. Then it was on to Ben Becula, which was quite a journey. We knew this was going to be a test for the battery. Um, when we arrived on Ben Becula, uh, close to the charger, this is what the charger looked like. Zero miles left, and the, uh, the car saying words to the effect of, there's a pain down the left, down the, down the diodes on my left hand side. I'm going to uh, slow you down. We only just managed to get to the charger. And then we found it was out of communication with HQ. We didn't have a card, so now we were connected to a charger that we had just made that stuck. We couldn't, there was no electricity. So what to do? Well, anybody who's traveled to these islands knows that people are not only self-reliant, but very friendly. And here is our rescue hero. This is what a hero looks like. This is Ian, the dentist. I can lend you my e-card for the rest of your journey to Scotland. I love these kindly island people. This was our, our lifesaver and we used the card uh, right the way around uh, Scotland. So with a fresh charge, it was off to the island of North Uist and uh, Peter and Anne Bird. They, the, Peter and Anne are old friends, and we stayed with them overnight. And the, here they related um, the story uh, of three local adults and two children who were drowned in January 9, 2005 by a high tide, driven by exceptional storm winds as they tried to drive across the flooded causeway. I've got a reference for the Guardian there if you want to look at it. It's um, uh, from October 2015, uh, South Hewis Storm Tragedy. And um, this really brought home to us that in these parts of uh, the UK, climate change is a real and present threat. If you look at the sea and then the houses, and look at the difference in sea level and see the beach line, you can see why this is a great worry. Uh, 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 in a sense, we see the Pacific Islands as being threatened, but actually right on our door doorstep, this is a real and present threat. And two um, uh, Finnish artists, uh, Pekka and Timo 
produced an art installation which was spectacular at night. This is installed in Loch Maddy. LED lights indicating the expected sea levels on the buildings if no action is taken by all of us immediately. A really spectacular um, uh, 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 lighting effect. And I think it might be something we could do in, um, in Northern Ireland. So in North Uist, we were simple, it was simple charging with Ian's card, and then it was off from North Uist to Harris. Here we're waiting for the ferry on a crystal clear January day with ice rings around the sun. Fantastically beautiful place. So this is um, just entering the, mountain the mountainous part of, of Lewis. We cross the mountains in freezing conditions. And I was amazed to see how many amateur radio antennas, antennas that were sprouting from cottages on the side of the road. I knocked on a door. The operator wasn't in. Uh, his wife was and said she would ring him. And from then on, uh, we were later told we had been tracked across the islands and we soon made contacts. We arrived on Lewis, which was our final destination, and met up with M Rolf and Mina. Mina Shepherd had organized several lectures in schools and the big public lecture for Rolf. And then uh, we went to this little graveyard. We remembered Ray Shepherd, who had recently died. And, um, uh, and uh, then we went, went on uh, to, to see some radio amateurs. So here we are, we met GM3JI, uh, uh, Juliet India, Juliet, uh, John Haig. Now he has a hilltop antenna farm and Chris, uh, uh, double M, O, K, double N, uh, a long wire antenna, which uh, you can see on the top left hand picture. It runs right the way down to that hut and faces the sea, such a simple antenna. Um, and with the reflection of the salt water, uh, these guys were getting huge distances uh, with low, low power. Uh, great guys with a passion for radio, living in the remote area of Garabost on Lewis. Look out for them on two meters if you can. They're frequently on two meters. And um, uh, they're on all, all, all wave bands. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, this uh, very radio quiet uh, area. So it was my turn. And here we found um, one of the problems of, of planning an expedition from the warmth of your uh, um, uh, 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 radio shack. It's January, it's the Outer Hebrides. It's minus t five to minus 10 degrees. And my poor little uh, Mola Morsky went as brittle as slate. And the first time I just touched it, it snapped off. And now I'm Morskyless. So uh, there's a top tip there for anybody. Use your plastic Mola Morsky, um, your three pound Mola Morsky uh, in warm weather only. Um, but not to worry, we had much better luck with six to seven watts of single sideband from the ICOM 703 gifted by my old pal, George Petrides. Several contacts made, plus a very, very memorable contact, a long QSO with the RNLI lifeboat station at Lizard Point in Cornwall from Lewis. Lewis to Lizard Point telephone quality we talked until i froze and i really really mean froze it was a bitterly bitterly cold day but i will never forget that call and it it kind of made the whole trip uh, uh, worthwhile so then it was back into stornoway and uh 
a global warming lecture. Actually, a series of uh, lectures uh, warning of global warming consequences. And his big message was this. We have 12 years to prevent runaway climate change. I said, Rolf, describe the world if we don't do it. He says, there are two uh, descriptions. Terrible, a terrible existence and slime world where only jellyfish and mold exists on the planet. And I said, where are we going? He said, right now we're heading for slime world. And he was very serious about this. So then we moved to Stornoway uh, uh, um, uh, uh, from one school to the next. Uh, and then we had to get Rolf home, back to Inverness, in Mission Free. Now, if you know Scotland, there are two large lumpen mountains, one uh, either side of the Great Fault, which is um, the one that Fort William, Fort Augustus, and Nairn and Inverness are on. So there's a big mountain on the left and there's a big mountain on the right. So we started in, um, in Stornoway. Well, that's easy. We charge up, get the ferry, and then uh, charge up again in Ullapool. This is what it looked like on the ferry. And this is what the charger looks like in Ullapool. It's a big, fat, 50 kilowatt charger. And uh, we, we, uh, we were now three heavy people with their luggage. And uh, it worked with Ian's card. It was still free of charge, I have to say. It was a good big plus. And uh, it got us over the mountains. And I have to say, um, uh, we got to the top of the mountains and then freewheeled with charging the car on the way down. And we needed that. But we were very comfortably into Inverness and we charged up at the local uh, town supermarket. Rolf was successfully delivered, emission free. Uh, we stayed overnight with our old friends, Royce Emerson, um, who used to be the uh, hospital um, engineer on Lewis uh, in Stornoway. And, uh, and, and Liz was a, a great cell cellist uh, or um, a, a contemporary um, of, uh, uh, well, that's classical music. You probably, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, de a detail too, too far probably, a great cellist. And um, uh, um, they both used to live on, on Lewis. And um, Nick, we connected with public transport. Job done. But I'm in Inverness. So we, we had uh, planned a series of charge-ups all the way across the Aviemore Ski Centre. Their fast charger, food and toilet, a bit of snow, and over the mountains I go again. By the time we got to Pidlockery, the battery uh, was flat. And here we found a welcome granny lead. This is only a, um, a one to three kilowatt charger at a campsite, very slow, but just enough charge to get us a fast charger to Perth. And once we're in Perth, it's simple, um, we cruise home down the line of motorway service station chargers at a steady 60 mile an hour. And I arrived at work 15 minutes late due to a local Manchester traffic holdup. Goal achieved. Here's the star. A little Nissan Leaf. The average cost for the thousand mile journey, one pence per mile. 5% of the diesel cost. The average speed, was from about 33 miles an hour, including the charge time. Rolf arrived home with zero emissions. And by the way, this is the best sounding uh, 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 system in, in, in a car, uh, the best sound system in a car as quiet as a Rolls Royce. I, it's, the, it's a Bose system, uh, it comes with it uh, as standard. 
So with great thanks to Navigator Nick and the amazing Scottish Baha'i community that enabled all this to happen. Uh, and thanks to the weather uh, that was for January, exceptionally mild. But maybe that's not a good thing uh, with the other consequences of global warming. The star again is the, is the car. Thank you. I hope this has provided some inspiration. The GQRP convention is this Saturday and Sunday. Ham Summers and a host of generally good, oh, sorry, generally really good speakers uh, will be inspiring another generation of QRP enthusiasts. Uh, go to uh, the, uh, if you just Google G -R -G -Q com and then go to the convention, uh, you will. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think I'm 15 seconds over my 40 minute allocation, so uh, I do apologize for that. And uh, I'll now unshare for questions. Uh, can you hear? Okay, yes, indeed, we can hear you there, uh, Les. Um, again, uh, I don't know how, how, how you managed to do it with the, the fantastic um, adventures that you get caught up in there, Les, <laughs> uh, and everything else along along your journey uh, with amateur radio and everything else. But uh, one of the questions I would ask is why QRP? Why QRP? You know, what is the whole purpose of QRP compared to maybe using 100 watts or 400 watts? Why do you like it so much, Les? Well, it's. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can yeah. you... We can't see you yet, but we can hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the little... Um, uh, uh, one second here. No problem. Uh, start my. I, you right. Okay, you forced the start. I think that should work. Can you see me now? Well, we can wow. see your picture. <laughs> why is it, why is that not working? One second. Let me just see this again. I'll, no problem. I'll I'll do it from here. Uh, uh, no, I start the video. It says your camera has not launched properly. Please track your browser. How do I do that? Not a clue, but we can hear your voice. So we're halfway there okay. anyway. <laughs> well, listen. Um, why? Why? Um, uh, why? Why uh, QRP? Well, uh, first of all, uh, high power is, isn't always necessary. If the conditions are right, you only need. Um, uh, 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 low power. Secondly, uh, to go from 100, uh, from, from say uh, uh, 5 watts to 100 watts and being battery powered, you need to add 5 kilograms to your burn. What? What are you doing? This is from the radio club. This is, I got on a Zoom. It's on Zoom. <laughs> I can I can hear uh, James simultaneously. I'm not sure what, what's happening here. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, you know um, George Dobbs used to say, uh, "Do more with less," and that, that to me is uh, a, a message which is good for the environment. And it's good for radio communication as well. So uh, building your own equipment um, for, as we've seen, we can build a complete radio station for less than 50 pounds. Um, making your own antenna, it's very, very satisfying. And uh, it's accessible to young people who maybe don't have a job, to retired people who perhaps don't have wads of cash. Um, but the principle uh, must be good because if you look at uh, the latest ICOM, the uh, um, 705, I think it is, um, 
it's it's being put out with huge sophistication all bands all modes um single sideband and uh and so on uh but it's uh, it's qrp it's it's less than 10 watts on single sideband um why uh, because it works because you can put it in a in a rucksack um you can uh, um um, walk up a hill, stick it on the back of a bicycle. Uh, it's mobile. When the power supply fails, you've still got your QRP rig. You can still communicate. When the internet fails, you can still use your QRP rig. And um, I know uh, there are modes now which are uh, QRPP almost, um, uh, FT7, FT8. Um, uh, but they still... Uh, need in, in internet and and um, uh, 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 complex uh, um, digital uh, um, there are complex digital modes. Um, sometimes simple is uh, is reliable, and um, I just love it. I just uh, think it's uh, it, 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 it's it, it provides a level of stimulation uh, that simply. Uh, buying a very large rig, um, putting a, um, a two kilogram manual on your knees and then spending the next two years trying to figure out how all the parts of the radio work. Um, it, it, it doesn't do that. You can make a, a pixie in, uh, uh, in an evening. Um, in a couple of nights, you can have it all connected up and, uh, uh, and, and working and, um, uh, and you know how it works. Okay, you're not going to go to Australia with a pixie, um, but with five watts, you certainly can go to Australia uh, because some people in Australia have very large antennas um, and very uh, sensitive receivers, and they can pick you up and do so. Um, uh, VK3MO is one of those people who particularly looks out uh, uh, for uh, UK stations on 20 meters um, uh, on QRP. So uh, if you ever hear VK3MO um, on 20 meters, a single sideband, and you've got a QRP or portable rig, uh, just get back to him. He'll definitely hear you. Great stuff, Les. Great stuff. Okay, if anyone has any questions at all about QRP work or anything, any questions for Les, feel free. Uh, there, you can unmute your microphone, uh, ask a question, and then for everyone else, uh, if you mute your microphone when you're finished again, we'll keep the the disturbance down to a, a minimum. So, feel free, folks. Go ahead if you have any questions there. Uh, did you uh, did you do much radio work while you were away? You didn't mention it uh, very much, but uh, uh, I wondered if you uh, had any DX or any interesting QSOs. Um, yeah, well, the the the, the best QSOs uh, that I had uh, the the problem was getting in the antenna, finding somewhere to put an antenna up. Uh, you can't really do it in the middle of town. Uh, we drove right out of the town and. Um, uh, and, and that provided a, um, uh, um, a very, very clean signal. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, we, we, um, we, we had, uh, I wouldn't call it DX, but, but um, uh, five watts uh, telephone quality, I mean, really five, nine um, signals. Um, uh, to, to, to Lizard uh, uh, until I froze to death. Uh, that was the that was the uh, 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 the thing. And and then um, uh, when I got to, uh, to 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 meet the the other radio amateurs, they wanted to uh, um, uh, they wanted to know what I was about, and we and we we spent a lot of time looking over their stations. Uh, rather than um, uh, getting out in the in the in the bad weather, my guess is in the summer uh, I would have spent a lot more time out outside. But it was bitterly cold. It literally was minus five to minus ten degrees centigrade, and a wind blowing. 
I can see your point. <laughs> <laughs> so I have There's a couple a of questions. Uh, okay, go on, go on, John. I was just going to ask, how long did the trip take you in total uh, from start to finish then? Uh, it was just over a week. That's not bad for electric. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I say, the the average um, the average speed was thirty three miles an hour. If you look at the average speed of tr traveling um, on that big truck that I can see in the background, um, it's probably only fifty six miles an hour. The Unless average speed you're... actually for a truck is about thirty six to thirty seven miles an hour. Believe it or not. Well, there you go. We're we're going the speed yeah. of a of a long distance truck. Yeah. That's, that's that's the average speed of our journey, over time. Yeah, well, we managed that. Uh, thirty-three mile, thirty-three miles uh, per hour, um, uh, from the time we got into the the vehicle to the time we left it on each um, on e on each uh, uh, large journey leg. So I discovered uh, when uh, when I was informed of this about the trucks that I, I did my own car. And believe it or not, because we stood not a city driving and just a small amount of country driving, the average speed for the car is about 15 miles an hour. Well, that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do 90% of our travelling um, on on the electric car. We only take the um, uh, uh, the we have a, a, an old diesel uh, um, Audi, and uh, that's taken out once a week for just to keep it alive, and a long journey once a year. 3,000 miles a year or less. Thank you very much. It was, it was interesting. It's definitely very interesting. Yeah, no problem, John. Okay, I'll go now. Um, uh, two questions. You've got um, uh, what looks like a chopping block with the equipment mounted on with Velcro yeah. strips. And you've got the, um, the molar key. Uh, well, yeah, but, does that have contact? Uh, no, no. The way we make the mo the, the, the the contact is um, uh, we take a penny and hot glue it to the uh, uh, to the cutting board. That's one contact. So we put a wire, one of the two wires, um, uh, to the uh, um, uh, if you like the, the Morse the Morse, Morse Morse plug, because most of these connections are made on a simple plug. So uh, um, uh, uh, we, there's only two two wires. So you know we we uh, we bolt, uh, drill a bolt through through the handle of of the uh, toothbrush. Uh, put a couple of uh, of nuts on it. Uh, a, a washer which has got the, um, uh, the, the 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 second lead to it. And now it's got a variable gap. So um, depending on how the, uh, uh, how, how the, 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 the toothbrush is behaving on the day, you can simply uh, increase or reduce the gap. Perfect. Oh, sounds, sounds interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, and three pounds for the yeah, lot. Three, um, broken, um, have you tried a broken uh, hacksaw blade? Uh, not yet. I, I want to make a side uh, a cootie type key, you know, um, the yeah, sidewinder yeah, with a yeah. with a, with, a with, with, with a Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, want did, 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 did the answer come through, Peter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah got, you got all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I take it the use in the chopping block is. Um, uh, it's a case of keeping all the equipment collected together and in one place. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, when I first started this journey, I had mint tins and uh, bits of heavy wire, uh, long bits of coax coming up to uh, antennas. When you plug the uh, antennas into the uh, mint tin, uh, what happens is the uh, uh, the mint tin just falls off the board and stick, you know, drags itself along the ground. So, um, you know, you need something which is uh, anti-gravity 
um, but flexible. And this idea of just coating a board, and a cutting board is perfect because it's got a handle, it's waterproof, it doesn't warp, um, uh, you, you can drill it, and um, uh, it's it's a perfect uh, uh, um, uh, base. Uh, or it, it, it reminds me of the old uh, um, back plane that uh, uh, was used for um, con electronic control gear. But you just basically uh, put a Velcro strip on the board and the opposite Velcro strip uh, on the underside of the, um, of the bits of equipment and away you go. It's, um, uh, you can chop and change, you can add audio filters, uh, stick a, um, a, a tuner on there, um, um, glue a battery or two to it. It all works. It's all stuck to the one board. Very portable, very light, and you can just throw it into a, into a, um, a carrier bag um, uh, wrap it up, sling it on the back of a of a, 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 a push bike, and away you go. Ah, push bikes. Yes, yes, I remember those. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. <laughs> or stick it in a rucksack. You know, it, it's all to do with um, uh, portability and utility. Yeah. Okay, well, Les, thank you again uh, for bringing us a, a, a talk on uh, the QRP, the Pixie Kits, uh, and never mind the adventure of traveling through the Scottish Isles uh, with zero emissions, and a topic, a subject, I suppose, um, that uh, is very real and that of climate change and everything else. Um, obviously, I know, but maybe some other folks don't know, you're actually soon to publish a book around QRP. Is that correct, Over? Uh, that's, that's correct. Um, if anyone's actually uh, um, done that, they'll know that, that the last um, bit uh, of, the, of, the, of the publication process is, is absolute torture. But that's where we are now. Yeah, there's... Um, uh, on 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 one um, way of measuring this, I have 150 pages in the, in already uh, finished. On another way of measuring, it looks like 200. Um, uh, the, I'm having it criticised at the moment. Uh, I think it will be an ebook, and therefore it will have moving pictures. You'll look at it on your iPads, and you, it will have lots of links. Um, uh, where you can order things f from and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, a really useful um, uh, 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 and inspirational guide uh, on low-power radio communication. Fantastic, fantastic. So we'll keep an eye out for that, and uh, when it does uh, come through, we'll definitely be... Uh, mentioning that and everything else and looking forward, forward to that. So again, Les, thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a word on uh, next week. Uh, next week we will have Jim Bacon and uh, let me just get his call sign because it has completely left my head. Um, well, G3YKL, I think it is, or YLA, off the top of my head, uh, who's going to be talking about prop quest, propagation, uh, and uh, two meter tropo, and everything else next week. So that's next week's uh, lecture series. Uh, and again, uh, everyone is welcome. If you're here for the first time this evening, uh, we hope you've enjoyed. Do come back. Uh, it's great to see you there. But don't feel as if you have to rush away now either. So, folks, uh, from the Tuesday night lecture team, uh, 7 3, and uh, we'll see you next week.